In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What are the limits to the human mind? Now, I'm not talking about something novel, like how smart can the smartest person be? But I am asking, what limits do we put on the use of human reason? How much can and should we use our brain to reason and think things out that don't appear to make sense? Putting mathematics, science, and all that stuff aside, let's ask this question solely in relation to things of the Bible. Do we put a limit on how hard we try to understand something from the Bible with our own human reason? If we put no limit, which some do, then anything in the Bible that goes against human reason cannot be true. Miracles, they wouldn't have happened as they were written, for there's no logical explanation to how, say, water can be turned into wine. Instead, some kind of trickery would have had to be involved. Jesus' resurrection, another miracle, therefore not possible because it again defies human reason. Jesus being born of a virgin, we would have to laugh that possibility away. With no limit, we put human reason above everything in the Bible. Human reason becomes the judge for what is true and false. As Christians, we know and see the danger of doing that. Where do we place our limit then? Today we have a perfect test case scenario to find out. Since Jesus' ascension, it appears as if he is gone from us. He went up into the sky until a cloud hid him from sight. He talked about going away and then he went away promising to return. He said that if he didn't go away, the comforter would not come. So it appears as if Jesus has gone from us that he is absent somewhere else. On the other hand, Jesus promised his disciples that he would never leave them. He said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Jesus is present with his church, not absent from his church. Here is where we run into a problem with our human reason. With what we can study and observe, it looks as though Jesus is no longer with us, yet he promises the opposite. Do we force an explanation in order to solve this? Before we do any of that, let's ensure we understand what exactly is going on in Jesus' ascension. St. Paul explained the ascension this way in his letter to the Ephesians. In discussing how God the Father raised his son from the dead, he wrote, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We should not expect to see Jesus walking on the streets of Jerusalem as he did nearly 2,000 years ago. Still, he is present with us. He did not ascend into heaven to be absent from his church. He ascended in order to fill all things so that he could be present with us in the church everywhere at all times. Now, this is a wonderful mystery. Jesus is not limited by space and time as we are. He can, be, is, he can be and is present in various different places at the same time. He ascended into heaven and is even now at the right hand of the Father. We must understand this properly. The right hand of God is not a geographical location millions of miles away from us. It's not as if Jesus is stuck somewhere else, absent from his church where he sits on a throne thinking about us or that he watches us from afar, maybe on a giant television screen that shows him what's going on here on earth. No, Jesus is here. 
The right hand of God is a figure of speech that means Jesus has equal power and authority to God the Father. Just as we say that you are someone's right-hand man, it doesn't actually mean that you're that person's right hand. Jesus, at the right hand of God, means that he who is humbled is humbled no more. He lives to rule over his church, and he does. When we call Christ's ascension into heaven and his seat at the right hand of God a mystery, we're not using our own label, but one that the Bible provides. St. Paul wrote about the mysteries of God in 1 Timothy 3.16. He wrote, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. At the end of that list, you heard the ascension mentioned as Jesus being taken up in glory. It's called a mystery because no human mind can fully understand it. We simply believe it because God himself reveals it. In 1 Corinthians 4.1, St. Paul refers to pastors as stewards of the mysteries of God. Our job is not to figure out these mysteries, but to teach them, to place them before God's people as clearly as we can. Now we start to see where we need to place a limit on the use of human reason. Human reason can't and shouldn't be used to explain the mysteries of God. Some things, such as these, will forever be beyond our understanding, no matter how hard we try. How the mysteries of God can be true, only God knows. We will never be able to understand how Jesus is present here with us at Christ our Savior Lutheran Church in Grimsby, and at the same time present with Christians on the other side of the world. Here is where the limit falls. However, that has not stopped some from trying to push it further. John Calvin, the famous Swiss theologian and the father of the Reformed churches, that's Reformed with a capital R, think of all the ones you see from West Lincoln to Vineland, he figured out that Jesus wasn't really present with his church. Calvin was a smart man, but his downfall was failing to put a proper limit on human reason. He understood through human reason that Jesus, as a man, could not be in more than one place at a time. He insisted that Jesus, as a man, was solely situated at the right hand of God, a place far away from us. For the church, this meant that Jesus could be present spiritually as God, but not fully as both God and man. Calvin's teaching is very reasonable. Human reason agrees that a man cannot be all over the world at different times while also up in heaven. But Calvin's teaching, teaching is also very wrong. Human reason can be good at times when studying the Bible, but without a proper limit, it becomes a judge of what is true or false. Human reason becomes more important than what the clear and plain word of God is saying. Calvin was putting Jesus in a box, saying that despite being God, he can't do what he claims. We need to submit humbly to God's word, even when it teaches us things that are completely against our reason. Take the Lord's Supper, for example. Calvin's highly educated human reason led him to deny that the bread of the Lord's Supper really is Christ's body. After all, Jesus' body is limited and cannot be at more than one place at the same time. So says human reason, so says John Calvin, so say the Reformed churches and most Protestants who follow the same reasoning as John Calvin did. But God says something quite different. God promises that Jesus, true God and true man, remains present with his church as he promised. Jesus promised that the bread is his body and that the wine is his blood. Jesus is not absent in heaven. Jesus is, at, is present with us here in his word and in the Lord's Supper. The whole Jesus, both God and man, is present wherever his word is proclaimed and wherever his sacraments are administered. Let human reason whine and complain about how it cannot understand these things. Faith believes it because God says it. So let it be said that this truth is important. Faith embraces what reason cannot understand. 
We set a limit on our human reason to understand the Bible because there are true mysteries that are not revealed to us. These mysteries are grasped by faith. This doesn't mean that through faith we will learn how Jesus' body is really in the bread or how Jesus ascended into heaven but is still with us here at this very moment. This means that we have faith to trust what God tells us just as children trust what their parents say even if they don't understand. We keep a simple faith, a faith which demonstrates our trust in the Lord. Therefore, let us have faith and believe that Jesus is where he says he is. He was present in your baptism to wash you clean. He is present in the Lord's Supper to feed you his precious body and blood. He is present with you when you pray, ensuring your prayers are heard. For he has ascended to the right hand of God in order to be with you throughout your whole life. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.